Welcome to General Practice Nurse Orientation Webinar in the series presented by AGPAL and QIP on behalf of Victorian Tasmanian PHN Alliance. Hello, I'm Jane Bollin and I'm a registered nurse working in Metropolitan General Practice in Adelaide. I'm accompanied by Gary Smith. Gary is a practicing practice manager of 36 years managing a 12 doctor owned general practice at the foot of the Blue Mountains in New South Wales. Welcome, Gary. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, like we'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners of the lands. We wish to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within our community. This webinar has been developed by Eastern Melbourne PHN on behalf of the Victorian and Tasmanian PHN Alliance, which is a collective platform for the seven PHNs in Victoria and Tasmania. This webinar was made possible with funding support from the Australian Government Department of Health. The Commonwealth of Australia, Eastern Melbourne PHN and the participating Victorian and Tasmanian PHNs do not accept any legal responsibility for any injury, loss or damage suffered as a result of the use, reliance upon or interpretation of the information contained in this webinar. This webinar is to be used as a guide only. So, Today we've set some learning objectives. We want to identify the practice layout and locate key documents. We want to get to know our team and consider the culture of our practice. We want to understand the many roles and responsibilities of the general practice nurse and how to fulfill their education needs. So welcome to general practice nursing. Some may say the nurse is the heart of the practice, but the patient is at the centre of our care. Together, we work with our GPs and other team members, such as receptionists and allied health staff to improve patient outcomes. We want everyone working at the top of their scope of practice. That is, doctors doing only what doctors can do and nurses doing only what they can do, but the whole team working together for better patient outcomes. You may be new to the quadruple aim. We aim to always be looking to improve the care for the patient, care for our population, sustainability of our practice and our health system, while also looking after our team. Your new practice. What does your new practice stand for? Does it have a clear vision and mission statement? A simpler way to put it is, what is its purpose or reason for being? Who makes up the community you service? Is it rural, remote or metropolitan practice? Is it in a new housing development? or an older, well-established suburb. This makes a difference to the type of people you'll be involved with and the skills and knowledge you need. For example, if your practice is in an area where there are a large number of nursing homes or retirement villages, you may need greater skills and knowledge around chronic disease management and care of the older people. In contrast, a new housing development may have more families with young children and your focus may be more childhood immunisations, family health and preventative care. You can learn so much from the practice website, newsletter, social media, but you'll gather so much more as you get to know your team. Find the practice policy and procedure manual. This is based on the RSEGP Standards for General Practice 5th edition and updated regularly. The manual covers most aspects of practice operation and outlines the parameters of your work. It is a key document used by surveyors during accreditation to assess the way that you do your work aligns with the practices, documented policies and procedures. Ask yourself, what is the role in delivering the vision and will I be able to access training, support, mentorship for the roles I'm required to do? Practice culture is so important. We want to be all working together towards a shared purpose. Find out what the communication's like. Are there whole of practice meetings and the nurses involved with the clinical meetings? Get to meet your practice team. Depending on the size of your practice, there'll be the practice manager, possibly other nursing staff, reception team, your GPs, allied health within your practice, or your healthcare neighbourhood, which is outside of your practice. Pharmacists also play a key role. We're all in this together, so we need to look after each other. 
Now, taking a tour of the practice and the induction process, the practice manager or other nurse will take you for a tour of the practice. Observe the front door, the waiting room, the toilets, where is the wheelchair? What are the practice opening and lockup procedures? Look at the reception area. Understand the flow of the patients across the practice. Look at the GP consult rooms, the nurse rooms, the treatment room. Locate the duress alarms if there are any. Where are the sample drugs and clinic stock? Take note of fire extinguishers, the emergency exits, the staff entrance. Locate the emergency trolley, the oxygen, emergency drugs and the defibrillator. Whereabouts is the vaccine fridge located? Have you got a steriliser? And where is the pathology collection area? Locate important documents. Where's the practice um, policy and procedure manual kept? And familiarise yourself with the human resources induction process. Is there a policy about occupational health and safety requirements? Have you got a position description? If you're a re registered nurse, do you supervise an enrolled nurse? If you're an enrolled nurse, who is your supervisor? Also find out how often you have performance reviews. Do you have any allocated lead roles such as infection prevention and control, cold chain management, and perhaps sterilising? Get to know the computer system. What practice software do you use? The appointment system. Different practices have different clinical software. So look at, you might have best practice, medical director, ZMED, there are others as well. Don't forget to ask for training and ensure you have a personal log on. Digital health, are you able to access my health records? The Australian Immunisation Registrar. Clinical audit tools such as Polar, PenCat or Medical Director Insights. And have you been given a PRODA account? Gary, do you wish to comment on the importance of the staff induction process? Thanks, Jane. I think an induction program should be a part of a practice's DNA, Jane. It's an important process for bringing new staff or staff who have a, a change of roles in your practice. It provides an introduction to the working environment and sets up the staff member to be able to deliver the expected outcomes of the business. Oh, thanks, Gary. Practice management. Who owns the practice? Who is the clinical lead? Every practice will be different, so it's important to know your practice organisational structure. Is there a delegation of authority diagram? And who do you report to? Get to know the reception area, the copier, the fax machine, the phones. Do you know how to hold and transfer calls? What are your messaging protocols? Find out about the practice fees for the billing and fees. What is the practice's policy on private billing versus bulk billing? And pensioners and children, are they looked after differently? Over time, familiarise yourself with common MBS billing pertaining to chronic disease management. And the nurse MBS item for chronic disease is 10997. Very important to remember that one. How is your general practice financed? There is MBS billing. There are eight different practice incentives programs, including the PIP QI. There's also the workforce incentive payments, which are paid by the federal government to encourage general practices to continue providing quality care, enhance capacity and improve access and health outcomes for patients. There are also alternative funding streams, such as departments of veterans affairs, work cover, and as well as employers for occupational health. Accreditation. Accreditation using the RACGP standards for general practice, fifth edition, takes place every three years. Find out where your practice is in its accreditation cycle. This is a continuous improvement process and is aiming to improve the safety and efficiency of the practice system. Communication, communication, communication. It is so important and will reflect the practice culture. Staff communication. How do we leave messages for each other? Are there internal messaging systems, such as notice boards, nurse meetings, whole of practice meetings? How are we heard and how do we hear what's going on? How do we communicate with our patients? Phone calls, SMS messaging, social media, website updates, 
What is the practice's policy about emails? Confidentiality agreement. Have you signed it yet? Make sure you do. Find out about the results and um, the recalls and reminders policy. Get the practice manager to show you the practice policy on results follow-up, recalls and reminders. There's another, another webinar on, this, um, on recalls and reminders in this series. Home visits. Do your GPs do home visits? Do the nurses do home visits? This is a really enjoyable part of my clinical role. I run a healthy ageing clinic and I conduct 75 years health assessments in the patient's own home. Now, we have to make sure we've got the right patient. So we have the mandatory use of three identifiers, the name, the address and the date of birth. Active patients, do you know what the definition is? The RAC GP defines it as three visits in the last two years. Your practice probably has a policy on archiving inactive patients. Patients' rights. So it, we all need to know we deliver care taking into account the rights, beliefs, religious and cultural background of the patient. This is linked to shared decision making. What information does your patient require to assist with making a decision about the various treatment options? Interpreter services, when required. Locate the phone number. The receptionist usually can help you with this. Triage. Discuss the triage processes at your practice. Many practices will have a chart at the reception area for the receptionist. Find out the nurse's role in assisting re receptionists with triage and when you need to get a doctor to assist to ensure patients are given an appointment commensurate with need and seriousness of their condition. There's also a webinar about this in this series. CPR training, are you up to date? Find out how the practice keeps you updated in your CPR. Other emergencies, how does the practice deal with other emergency? Find out what your role is in this. The treatment room, this has been the traditional role of nurses in general practice. In any new clinical environment, you must review your scope of practice and develop a CPD plan to meet your new role's requirements. You need to be educated, authorised, competent, confident. So let your practice manager know if you require further training in immunisation, wound care, venipuncture, ECGs, Dopplers, spirometry, ear syringing assisting with minor surgical procedures, and iron infusions. Do not undertake anything you do not feel is within your scope. Remember, it has an impact on patient safety and working outside of scope of practice could impact your registration. Refer to the APRA Nurses Professional Codes and Guidelines. There's also a webinar in this series about immunisation. The nurse's role is dependent on the practice policy and procedure as well as your own nurse role description. Familiarise yourself with the management tasks, which could include the stock management, who restocks the clinicians and treatment rooms, which stock is the nurse responsible for? For example, like dressings, pathology supplies. Who's responsible for checking the expiry dates on clinical stock and stock rotation? Does the nurse have a role in the clinical equipment management? When is it serviced? How often do you need to check? Medication management. There'll be monthly checking of the doctor's bag, other medications such as B12 injections, medications, samples, and adrenaline in the anaphylaxis kits. Expiry date management. Don't forget to refer to your state legislator for requirements around managing drugs in general practice. Cold chain management. Who orders the vaccine and what is the process when vaccines are received? Are you confident with the implementation of Strive for Five, the National Vaccine Guidelines? There's also a webinar in this series about vaccine and cold chain management. Infection prevention and control. Uh, the RACGP has uh, guidelines on the infection prevention control standards, fifth edition. Find out whether your practice sterilises on-site or off-site, or do you use disposable instruments? Some of these tasks may be delegated to a non-clinical staff member. But don't forget to have a look at the webinars for 
further information on infection control. Chronic disease management and care planning. Our health assessments are not available for everyone. So find out what health assessments are available so you can proactively invite the right population groups for a health check. GP management plans, including team care arrangements. A chronic medical condition is defined as any cancer or medical condition that has been or is likely to be present for six months or longer. For example, asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, musculoskeletal conditions and stroke. Patients with a chronic condition are eligible for a GP management plan or a care plan, as we say. Chronic disease management planning is person's care is so much more than an item number and a patient demanding a referral to a podiatrist. Find out your practice owner's attitude towards care plans and chronic disease. They do make a difference if done thoroughly and reviewed every six months. It's important we do this well as this is the fastest growing area of general practice where there are opportunities for nurses to support patients living with chronic conditions. GPs and nurses can work together supporting the patient. In our care plans, we use motivational interviewing and, as well as health coaching to get improved patient health outcomes. Your role as a nurse in this is going to make a difference to each and every one of these people. Planned care versus acute care. Is your practice culture about reactive or proactive care? For the best patient and business outcomes, we should aim to be proactively inviting patients with chronic conditions to the practice to have a care plan and regular reviews. This way we can see the patient when they are well and help them to self-manage. Population management. We can use clinical audit tools to find the patients with specific conditions. We're then able to analyse the data and devise the necessary strategies to bring the patients in for regular care. Coordinated care. As part of the care plan, the nurse can work with GPs to coordinate the care of the patient. There are also webinars um, in this series on health assessments, chronic disease management and coordinated care. Quality improvement. Now, what gets measured matters. How good is your practice? The PIP-QI, the Practice Incentive Program, Quality Improvement Program, commenced in August 2019. Practices are paid quarterly incentive payments to improve quality improvement initiatives using PDSA, that is, Plan, Do, Study, Act cycles. The PIP-QI program requires data to be submitted on 10 quality indicators. However, the QI initiatives are not limited to these indicators. Evidence of quality improvement activities need to be retained by the practice. There is also a webinar in this series. Nurse clinics. Some GP practices run nurse-led clinics based on skill set and the needs of the practice cohort. This is where the practice has identified a need in their population and the nurse can develop a process to coordinate with their team to deliver care to a specific group of patients. Greater use of the nursing workforce can address the needs of our specific populations in our very different general practices in Australia. Here are some examples of nurse clinics currently in Australian general practices. It does depend on your passion and skill set and the needs of your community. I run a healthy ageing clinic. This is about helping older people continue to live in the community with the help of their general practice team. There are also women's health clinics, wellness clinics, men's health outreach, cancer survivorship, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clinics, dementia clinics, teen clinics, perinatal and immunisation clinics. Gary, have you any thoughts on nurse clinics in general practice? I believe, Jane, that um, integrated multidisciplinary care is the future of primary health care. And the delivery of services to our different cohorts of patients, as you identified, is becoming more challenging for us all but we need to realise it's the future. We must remember that we should never assume that staff can do the role. New opportunities like nurse clinics require an orientation program as it, as it needs to be a whole of practice approach. Oh, thanks Gary, that's great. Um, the missing aim, uh, care team wellness. Now getting back to the nurse being the heart of the practice, does the practice have a culture of employee wellness and care? Health and well-being 
of ourselves is vital. We're a caring profession, so self-care is an imperative, but the workplace does need to bring joy. Does the practice subscribe to an employee assistance program? Is there access to massage or do you have staff, uh, do your staff have other means of access to counselling and support? Are there practice policies on inappropriate behaviours such as equal employment opportunity, sexual harassment or bullying? You'll probably find these in the practice procedure and policy manual. In the future, we will require more nurses and there'll be new roles. We'll be growing our practice teams to include more nurses so GP teams can be more effective. Think of what is expected of high performing primary care now and in the future. Acute care, prevention, early detection, early intervention of chronic conditions, disease monitoring, end of life palliative care, and so much more. There's telehealth and remote monitoring of patient home clinical devices will be next. Patients want continuity and access to high quality, comprehensive, coordinated care. This means they want good relationships with their nurse as well as their GP. So just summarising, uh, by now you would be orientated to your practice. You've met the people and found the key documents required. You will understand general practice is very diverse and incredibly skilled. So it is time for you to reflect on what skills you have. Do they match the requirements of your position description? Understand your scope of practice. Learn where you can go for further training, mentorship and assistance. And above all, look at ways to have joy in your work. But overall, be valued, visible and respected. Gary, do you have anything else to add on the general practice nurse orientation? Um, just in summary, Jane, is that, um, as I've previously said, staff orientation should form part of our, of our DNA. I think we need to invest in the time, the energy and the resources up front. I know we're all time poor, but if we don't invest up front, there will be further challenges in moving forward like productivity and performance. It's false economy if we do not set the framework and expectations in the beginning of a staff's employment journey. Oh, I thoroughly agree, Gary, that's very true. So for further education and support, you'll find these websites at, um, that you can click on the links. There's also the health pathways. And I've just provided you with a few activities to help you consolidate your um, practice orientation. So locate the practice and procedure manual and look at your job description and how do you match your skills against the job description. Now, any feedback or future support on the webinar should be directed towards your PHN. Thank you. Thanks, Jane.